The two main aims of Bush Blitz were to provide baseline data on flora and fauna in these newly acquired reserves and also to discover new species. So what we did was uh, choose reserves that we thought were interesting to science. Um, they were reserves that we wouldn't normally go to, so, so fairly isolated reserves. Um, but on the other hand, we also chose reserves that were fairly close to population centres as well because we thought they would be interesting to the um, Tasmanian public. We were able to involve scientists from um, many disciplines. Often when you do a survey of a, of a particular area, it's usually only concerned with surveying one particular group of animals. So for example, plants are very well surveyed in Tasmania and also vertebrate animals. It's, it's quite unusual uh, to have a really comprehensive survey and in this case that's what we were aiming to do. We were aiming to get together as many scientists as possible that could survey the wide breadth of animal species that are found in a reserve and also plants. And what made bush blitz unusual was that not only were we surveying plants and vertebrate animals, and by vertebrate animals I mean marsupials and birds, we also surveyed quite a few groups of invertebrates, which are usually neglected in these types of surveys. Um, in areas that were remote especially, you, you have to be very sure that the area is going to be safe enough, that the roads, you can have access roads into the area, um, that uh, there will be somewhere for the scientists to stay, for instance, um, somewhere to eat. Um, uh, yeah, so I spent a few months um, going to each of these areas and checking out all those sorts of practicalities. Every scientist has a different collecting methodology according to his, his group of animals and it can actually vary quite a lot. Uh, I think probably the, the, um, the one part of collecting methodology that unites all scientists is that we, we try to cover as many varied habitats as possible and that's because the more varied habitats you survey the more number of species you, you can actually um, collect and record. So for instance, someone like Kevin Bonham, whose area is land snails, he, uh, what he does is, again, he tries to cover different habitats, but he will also target microhabitats. With snails, often um, you need moist areas. Um, uh, often if you have an area that's got high calcium carbonate in the soil, such as areas where you find caves, that's often a good area to find snails as well. So he will target a certain area and then basically just get down his hands and knees. Well, this is a quite an unusual, an unusual environment. We don't have many, uh, don't have many river islands that you get to look at. And um, river islands, have quite strange ecologies for instance so uh, on uh, Tamar Island I found a native snail that appears to be a new species even though Tamar Island is very degraded and yes that is the uh, the wet forest one that I I got here before this thing would normally be it's only a juvenile so the, the, the snail would normally be an adult will be eight millimeters wide or so um, this is normally found in uh, very wet closed forest often in uh, Often in uh, rocks under rocks at the bottom of gullies, and it's very different to in the swamps of Egg Island. Snails are uh, basically uh, most most snails. Different snails do different things in the ecology, but most snails are uh, are little decomposers, so they help in the uh, in the breakdown of uh, of leaf litter and decaying bark. Uh, they also they also uh, eat fungi, and obviously they're uh, involved in the calcium cycle because of the calcium that they carry in their shell. In total, we found 130 new species of animals. Um, we collected over 2,000 specimens. Um, and so in terms of, of new species, that was fantastic because it means that we can now describe 130 new species for Tasmania. Um, as far as the collection of actual specimens, we now have, um, for all the areas that we surveyed, they're all new records for Tasmania. So that means that we've, um, in, in a lot of cases, increased the range um, that we know particular species actually live in. And there were some very interesting results as far as ranges go. Um, we found um, a species of damselfly, for instance, um, up in the northwest of Tasmania where we surveyed, uh, that has only, well, uh, until very recently, 
recently was only believed to have lived in Victoria uh, and it was actually considered to be a threatened species in Victoria. A couple of years ago it was found on the east coast of Tasmania and we've now found a specimen on the, in the far northwest of Tasmania. So it's vastly increased the range of that particular species. Not only are we, are we being funded to actually go and collect specimens, but we, we're also going to be funded to do taxonomic work on those specimens. So I'll spend the next probably at least two or three years working on, on describing new species that we found. And not only me, but other scientists as well. Well, as far as the museum goes, I mean, it, it's, it's a, a vast increase in the number of records we have, um, uh, especially in terms of zoological records. There hasn't been a, a lot of um, uh, zoology collecting in Tasmania over the last 100 years, and so that, that intensive effort has, has increased our holdings by, by a large number. It, it means that scientists that study particular groups of animals can now look at our records and, and can look at the distribution of, of particular species but, and, and also um, can actually come to Tasmania and actually look at the, the specimens themselves and, and work on them. Tasmania's, um, Tasmania's biology is of, is of great interest around the world so it's, it's always very interesting for many scientists to know that we've, we've actually um, uh, increased our holdings of, of, of particular specimens by a large amount. I mean, the only way we know about biodiversity is to actually go and find what's what's there, basically, in, in terms of animals and plants. It's very, very difficult to be able to as assess biodiversity and, and, for example, the the conservation significance of an area if you don't really know what's there. It, it, it gives you a, a very um, powerful tool to actually as assess biodiversity. For instance, climate change is is is, um, is is foremost in people's minds as as far as you know changes in the environment goes. In Tasmania it's particularly important because we have a lot of alpine and semi-alpine environments and a lot of those plants and animals are going to be severely compromised by climate change. Because we've gone out and actually surveyed areas and we did actually survey um, semi-alpine areas, we can actually in the future document any sort of changes that, that might be occurring in those areas. So that's just, just, just one example of, of what you can use this sort of data for.